if you would stand up with me, Genesis chapter 39 is where we are. <clears throat> I'm going to begin in verse 4. So Joseph found favor in Pharaoh's sight. He attended him. He made him overseer of his house, and he put him in charge of all that he had. From that time on, he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, and the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. Another translation, come to bed with me. But he refused. And he said to his master's wife, behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in this house. And he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in the house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. Now, how then can I do such great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. But one day, when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house were in the house, she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said, To them, see, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice, and as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled, and he got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her until her master came home, and she told him the same story, saying, the Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came in to me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him, put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison. Our father... There is not a man or a woman, including the man on the stage, that does not have to address the issues that are before us today. We confess to you, Heavenly Father, that we are in need of power that can only come from you. We confess that all of us in one form or another have blown through the moral boundaries of our life, whether it be in mind or in heart, or whether or not we have carried it through to action. I would ask tonight, Father, for all of us who wish that we could pull out a giant eraser and take out the semicolons and the commas and the ands and the buts, that could erase the things that happened in junior high, in high school, in college, in our adult years, that you, O oh God, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, might come. You said in Matthew 5.18, Jesus, that the pure in heart will see the Lord. And we know that purity cannot come because of how we grit our teeth to earn it. It must come from you. Father, will you heal the hearts that have been so injured because of the misuse of sexuality? Will you protect the men and women in this room of such a powerful force when you said be fruitful and multiply that it has the power to make a home 
or to destroy it. And might you guard us, Lord, that we would be a people different than the culture by which we live. We also think of our children as they continue to grow. Many of us in this room have kids that are being taught in secular systems or by the culture of the day that they have the freedom to define themselves as they desire to define themselves. They have the freedom to do whatever it is they desire to do. They are their own God. And Father, we know because of your word that when you desire to go your own way, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. Preserve them. Protect them. Guard them. Because nothing that you do is anything but life-giving. This was one of your great gifts. Help us not to destroy it, I pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. <laughs> you can be seated. I want to confess to you tonight on the onset of this message that I have probably preached this now uh, to tens of thousands of people in one form or another. I have so much material on this that I want to be careful not to go too long and I want to be careful to be very simple. I also want to confess to you tonight that over the course of 25 years of pastoral ministry, there are two er areas, two issues that come up repeatedly over and over and over again in my ministry, and it is what is going to burn down your house, my house, if it is not rightly submitted to the Lordship of Christ. One is the issue of finance and money. Over and over, power and money go together. And you will discover historically, and you will discover when you look at the New Testament that Jesus speaks more about money than he even speaks about heaven. And it's because it competes for your heart's affections. Sexuality is the other. It is secret and it is only known to you and the Lord what really goes on in your heart. When someone sins sexually, it was never because of the moment of temptation. It was because of how they managed their life before the temptation struck. So as I begin tonight, I simply ask that you would not think about the men and the women whom you can point to, but instead you would sit in your own seat or you would watch by live stream or for the many that will watch during this week, and you will think solely of you and the Lord because he loves you. Most of you here know Jesus Christ, so you're the king's kid. And the king wants nothing more than the well-being of his children. Nothing about sexuality in the economy of God is anything but holy and a great gift. He loves it. When I was growing up and it was taught, it was always taught as something to be ashamed of. God could not be further from that position. He loves sex. And he loves sexuality. But he loves it in his design. California is not his design. So let me begin tonight with a story. I'll be conscious of time. I may even have to stop midst where I may be going because I want to be conscious of the fact that many of you will have to get home. This story was when my oldest and his dad were having special time. Daniel was about eight years old, 
He's not here tonight. He's at Westmont. Daniel loved hanging with dad. So dad decided to take Daniel to what is Dave and Buster's in Arizona. We were on a trip to see my parents, but we were staying in Scottsdale. And Dave and Buster's had changed names to a place called Jillian's. It's where you can go to bowl and eat. It's where you can go to sit and play pool and eat. It's where you can go play video games and eat. It's the perfect place for Pastor Dan. (laughs) I grew up playing Mrs. Pac-Man. I love Mrs. Pac-Man. Mrs. Pac-Man reminds me of all things which are the greatest decade that has ever been, I consider, the 80s. If I could roll my pants, I would. If I could dress in bright colors, I would, but not at this weight. The 80s are remarkable. Mrs. Pac-Man was being played by Daniel. He was on a stool. We had swiped the card, and there he was, and he was playing Mrs. Pac-Man, wonka, 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 and it was coming along, and he was doing a great job. Now, Daniel, by his own admission, will tell you at the age of three and four and five and 18 and 19, was a very active child. And he often found himself in some form of trouble. So it was not overly surprising to me when for a moment I had taken my eyes off of him and overcame a young 20-year-old man. And he said to me, is that your son? And I said, well, it actually is my son. But inside I thought to myself, oh, no, what has Daniel broken that I'm going to have to pay for? He said, well, you have a good-looking son. Well, this is an odd conversation, but thank you very much. I appreciate that. He said, are you a married man? I said, I am. Do you not see the ring on my finger? He said, well, I've been watching you from a distance from across the room. And I'm wondering if you would like to go with me and your son and hook up. Now, I looked at him, and I was sitting on a stool when he approached me. Good-looking, strong, young, 20-something. When I stood up off of my stool, I stood up not as a pastor, but I stood up as a man and a dad. And I came and approached him, and I said, I want you to explain to me what is going on in your life that you would approach a stranger and you would approach his boy. Let me tell you about Jesus. Now, I wasn't sure whether or not I should send him to Jesus or whether I should tell him about Jesus. But when that happened, it began to dawn on me that what is taking place in the culture by which we live, and this was years ago, in the hearts of men and women who have secret places that nobody else sees until finally it's too late, is a world by which can burn down your house. Listen to me. There are some sins that if you live with them long enough and you live with them deep enough, not only do they have the power to move you outside of the moral boundaries of your life, but they have the power to burn down your house I have thousands of hours counseling men and women. And I have thousands of hours by which now I have seen the Word of God bear out the truth of what God says. Sexual sin cannot be managed. Sexual sin is something that must be cut off. You have to put it to death. I have never met anybody in my life who has gone to marriage and said, 
in five years, I want to let you know, sweetheart, I'm going to be committing adultery. And yet I've counseled probably tens, twenties, if not hundreds of couples that have wound up in some sort of sexual relationship outside of marriage. I have never stood before a couple for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to then have a man say to me, but you know what? In a few years, I'm going to be addicted to porn. I will tell you in the world that we are living right now that if you find yourself listening to what the television tells you and the movies scream at you and the computer begins to say, click here, I'm only 18 years old, and you go to follow it, you're going to take an on-ramp onto death. It's like taking a large glass of toilet water and downing it into your body. It poisons your soul. And it is going to stop you from the call that Jesus Christ has on your life. You are to burn like a raging fire for the person of Christ in this world. Pornography, immorality, sexuality outside of God's design is going to so diminish your life that at best you will have a flicker of a candle rather than blazing like the noonday sun. God does not call you to slavery when he calls you to becoming his son or his daughter. And if I could take out a big eraser and deal with two areas in the lives of believers, it would be the secret sin first of sexuality because all of us have to deal with this. And the other would be to take out a giant eraser of the sins of covering up Well, maybe I ought to let that one go. My friend, tonight, I want to encourage you. Joseph may have lost his coat, but he never lost his character. And when it comes to what it's going to be for you, I want you to know tonight, sexual temptation is coming. I have two points. One is called the approach, and the other is called the answer. The approach to sexual sin and the answer to sexual sin. Now Joseph was handsome, verse 6, in form and appearance. Egypt was the most advanced culture in its day. Do not think of it as something, anything other than the very place that you're living. The pyramids were already there for probably a thousand years by the time Joseph had arrived. There was culture, there was learning, there was life, there was all sorts of economic boom, and there was temptation everywhere. In fact, the history books record that Egyptian women were a byword for lewdness, as the stories are told, it was impossible even for the pharaohs to find a woman that had not already been in the custody of four or five different men. One of the stories is that a pharaoh went looking for a wife that was in every way only to him, and he found one woman that was faithful to her husband, and so he stole her from her husband and took her for himself. Everything in the culture was a culture by which it said, I can have what I want to whom I want, where I want. And Joseph is a good-looking cat. His mother, the Bible says, Rachel, was a beautiful woman. His father was a strong man. He had the body of his dad, and he had the face of his mama. And where he went, people took notice very few times in the Bible 
does the Bible describe the physical features of a man or a woman? And it sets apart the moment as it does for us when you see something of beauty. When you look at Abram who has a beautiful wife, he's trying to figure out how not to get killed because his wife is so beautiful when he arrives where? In Egypt. Because he knows that in Egypt he can be killed Because the pharaohs or the rulers of the day will come and they'll lop off his head in order to have his bride. Beauty is held in high esteem. And this boy had it. He could have walked off the cover of a magazine. Whatever product they used for hair, he had it going on. Whatever ode to Calvin Klein was happening on his body, it fit just perfect. Whatever he did when he turned to his left or to his right, he was a specimen. He was put together. And in being put together, it started to catch the eye of someone called Potiphar's wife. I find the approach so striking. And after a time, how long? We don't know. We just know that somewhere along the way, Potiphar's wife wasn't managing what was taking place inside of her heart in a way ultimately that had anything to do with the one who put her on planet earth. Joseph becomes a slave. Pretty soon after being a slave, somebody starts to take notice, say, hey, did you see that guy in the sunrise? Hey, did you see that kid when he was showering off after a long day's work? Do you see him in those cutoffs? His master's wife cast her gaze on Joseph. It starts so subtle. After a time, we don't know how long, but somebody was thinking about it. Somebody was looking at it. Somebody was considering it. And not only was she considering it, But soon her consideration of it was just going to be a flat-out striking and then sustained approach. In verse 7, she's going to say, come to bed with me. Lie with me. In verse 10, he would not listen to her, and she would say again, lie with me. Come to bed with me. Proverbs chapter 5 has something to say before the roaring 20s and the free love 60s and 70s. And this is applicable, I think, to all of us, regardless of whether God has made you a male or a female. But listen to how God speaks about it when he speaks specifically to his boys. Chapter 5, my son, my beloved boy, be attentive to my wisdom. Some of you have never had a dad. This is a dad speaking. Incline your ear to my understanding that you might have a legacy, that you might keep discretion and your lips may guard knowledge. Now, men, for a moment, let me speak to you. If you want God's best for your life, and if you want a woman worth her salt to be faithful, excited when you come home, wants to stand beside you and go the distance for what God has called you to be, this woman has been built with internal radar to know if your eyes are for her, your mind is for her, your desire is for her, your commitment is to her, and it begins with your God. God is thinking even if you're single about your marriage right now. What does he say? The lips of a forbidden woman drip honey. 
pay attention to me. There's a place that you can go where speech appears smoother than oil. But in the end, it's going to destroy you. Her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the path to Shoal. She doesn't even ponder the pathway to her life. My precious pride and joy. Now look at verse 3. Men, how does the temptation play in your life? Verse 3. She drips honey. She entices him. Her speech is seductive, verse 3. She verbally arouses him. Verse 4 and 5, she is loud and defiant. You don't have to go looking for her. She's coming to you. She lurks at every corner. Put your finger on chapter 6 and go over to verse 25. Do not desire her beauty in your heart. Do not let her what? Her eyes capture you with her eyelashes. I think this is remarkable. You think God doesn't know how he's wired you? Now look at what's happening to Joseph. When he left home, he was 17 years old. Now he's been lifting. Now he's been in the sun and he's tanned. Now he's starting to get to be known in the household, and he's got some authority. And now he's being noticed not just for the good things, but he's being noticed now for the things that you don't really desire. Joseph easily could have done what 99% of the males that I have been with in my life have done. This is perpetual spring break. I can do whatever I want to do, however I want to do it, for whatever reason, I desire to do it. What does God say to his men about the blessings that he wants to give them? Guard your heart, boys. It holds the wellsprings of life. Could you imagine if Joseph had been managing his sin because the desire plus the opportunity would have equaled the destruction of the pathway God wanted for him. This is the radical issue of the day for men. Ladies, It is not without temptation for you. The temptation that most often comes via estrogen Americans is the temptation of, I want to be valued, I want to be seen, I want to be fought for, I want to hug, I want somebody to protect me, I want somebody to tell me I'm worth fighting for, I want to be present in somebody's life. Almost every study of what you read about in the lives of females is that sexual release, orgasm, is not what is most significant. It's the knowing that there's safety. It's the comfort of one who provides intimacy. It's the hug, it's the rest, it's the peace. Joseph, come to bed with me. Can't you imagine what Potiphar's wife is saying to Joseph? I promise I'll never tell him a thing. Just one time, Joseph. All I'm asking is one moment. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 27 and 28, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who lusts after a woman has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Could you imagine if Joseph were feeding this at the level of his imagination, 
you're done. And I think there is a setup for every one of you from the time you're born to cause you to initiate something in your life that's going to burn down your house sexually. And for some reason, it's not preached about from the pulpits. I personally remember at eight years old, living in Arizona, my buddies saying to me, Danny, because that's what all the boys called me, we found something out in the desert. You got to come with us and check it out. So we climbed over the wall. We went way out into the desert. And there out in the desert was the largest stack of porn you've ever seen. And back then, you actually had to pay to go across the counter to get the magazine, to read the magazine, and to face somebody that was going to give you change. Today, you don't have to do it. At eight years old, I still remember the feelings I had inside of me when I saw those pictures. It was not just a curiosity. It was both a shame and an enticement. From that moment on, I woke up. Everything about the desire of Lucifer is to wake you up apart from God. It is to destroy your life by causing you to believe that you can manage this sucker. You can have fun with this thing. You can play with this thing. You can turn it over. You can think about it. You can come and fantasize about it until the point that what takes place in you is so far uniquely different from anything that God had originally intended. And the irony of the passage is this is not happening in the heart of a boy. It's happening in the heart of a girl. She's the one managing it. She's the one living with it. She's the one turning it over. And this is not simply something happening in her heart. This is something that now moves from the desire inside of her to the actions of her hands and the actions of her feet. This is exactly how it works. You sow a thought, you reap an action. You sow an action, you reap a habit. You sow a habit, you reap a character. You sow a character, you reap a destiny. And how does she handle him? Don't I smell good? Don't you see what I'm wearing? I'm wearing it just for you. Don't you like what happens when I come just a little closer? And what's Galatians 6, 7 say? Joseph, God can't be mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that will he also reap. Isn't it interesting that in the Bible, the same issue of lust as Jesus uses it with pornea is the same issue of adultery. God is saying to you and to me in this striking approach, I want you to take your sexuality as seriously as I take it. And the problem is not here. The problem is here. It's inside of what you fuel so that you're to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of Christ and you're to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You can't manage it. Joseph, come to bed with me. Verse 7. Joseph, come to bed with me. Verse 10. Joseph, come to bed with me. Verse 12. 
How many do you know that would have said no to the consistent willingness of another when they make themselves available? Do you think that Pharaoh's, do you think that Potiphar's wife wasn't a beautiful woman? Think it was an easy task for him? I don't think so. I think that what Joseph decided to do was to just say, I love my God more. I'm going to follow him with all my heart, regardless of what it means for me. Now, because some of you have not spent any time in this role, you will not know that I could spend every waking moment of my life counseling people entrenched in pornography. Listen to the story of one who did the same. Ted Bundy, an infamous serial killer, granted an interview to psychologist James Dobson just before he was executed on January 24th, 1989. In the interview, he described the agony of his addiction to pornography. Bundy goes back to his roots and explained the development of his compulsive behavior. He revealed his addiction to hardcore pornography and how it fueled the crimes that he committed. By the time Bundy was apprehended, at least 28 young women and girls had things contemplated or done to them that are too horrible to mention, and Ted Bundy was sentenced to death. Ted Bundy was anxious to meet with Dr. Dobson, but what was he going to say? So Dr. Dobson went, actually, if I remember correctly, the day before the electric chair, and there with tears in his eyes, Ted Bundy described the monster that took possession of him when he decided to go down a dark hole that could not be satisfied. About 2.30 in the afternoon, James Dobson met and said, Ted, tomorrow morning at 7, if you don't receive another stay, you're going to be executed. What's going through your mind? Ted Bundy said, I won't kid you or say something that I feel that I'm in control or have come to terms with, but the truth is it's a moment-by-moment moment thing. In this moment, I'm feeling calm, and he said that he was thankful to be speaking with James Dobson. Dobson said, how did it happen, Ted? Take me back. What were the behaviors Ted said, well, that's the tragedy of the whole situation. I grew up in a wonderful home with two dedicated and loving parents. I grew up of one of five with brothers and sisters. We were the focus of my parents' lives. We regularly attended church. My parents didn't drink. They didn't smoke. They didn't gamble. There was no physical abuse. There was no fighting. There was no... There was, there was no major problems. It wasn't leave it to beaver, but it was fine. As a young boy at the age of 12 or 13, I encountered outside of the home in the local grocery and drug stores softcore pornography. And there, my friends and I, we began to explore the neighborhoods. We went through the dumpsters and the garages. Today it's the phones and the computers. It always had to become more graphic. This included every type of magazine, and it fueled my fantasies. In the beginning, I had thought processes until pretty soon they were fueled and they crystallized in my mind, and I became something I never considered I could be. James Dobson says, how long did you stay at this point before you actually assaulted someone? 
you've said, Ted, you became addicted to it. And as I look at this kind of addiction, it becomes more and more potent, more explicit, more graphic. You need more material. Ted said a couple of years, I was dealing with very strong inhibitions, and then one day it took over. I knew it was wrong. I shouldn't have been thinking about it, but I was on the edge. And the last vestiges of restraint were being tested consistently and assailed through my life. Do you remember when you pushed it over the edge, James Dobson said? It's a very difficult thing to describe. And I'll stop there. Listen, my son. Pay attention to me, Solomon says, my son. Do not turn your hearts to this path. Joseph. Here I am. And what does Joseph say? He refused, verse 8. What a great moment. He said to his master's wife, Behold, everything has been given to me in charge of this house. He's not greater than me in this house. Nor has he kept back anything from me in this house other than you, his wife. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against you, against Potiphar, against God? My friend, the only way I know to handle sexual temptation is to flee it. You have to run from this thing in your mind, in your heart. There are reasons why to this day, as Joy knows, I do not have open computers. I do not have open phones. I do not walk around in my day having the ability to look something up when I want to look it up. And the reason for that is great pastors, far better speakers, I think better husbands, better men, than I have been in my life, have fallen in moments of weakness, moments of despair, moments where the pain is great, and they've gone over the edge. This is not something simply for men. This is something for the women. Is it not true that God has made you sexual? Is it not true that you do not desire to be desirable? to be intoxicating, to have somebody want to see you and know you and pursue you. This woman's not going to let it go until one day opportunity presents itself and there Joseph is by himself in the house. None of the men of the house were there, verse 11. So she caught him by his garment. What, like a hunk of beef? I don't think so. I think she wrapped her arms around him. I think she pressed her body to him. Come to bed with me. He's away from home. Potiphar doesn't have to know. And Joseph left his garment in her hand and he fled and he got out of the house. The answer to 50, 60, 70 years of marriage is that you choose to flee what culture says to embrace, and you pour out your affections upon God and your affections upon the person that God has given you. And you put to death everything that doesn't please the Lord. My friend, Joseph would go to the dungeon for doing the right thing. How bad do you want to honor Jesus? 
Because I'm talking to people that in the last 48 hours have turned on their secrets to porn. I'm talking to men and women who are going to watch this by live stream and they're in the middle of an affair. I'm talking to people, real people, that right now you like the look that lingers. You like the pursuit of the eyes and the gaze. You enjoy the hug that lasts a little bit too long. And you are in danger of burning down everything God wanted to give you for free. It's okay if you end up by yourself in a dungeon hole for honoring the Lord. You might be by yourself, but you're not alone. And I will tell you, my friend, there is not one moment in your life that God in 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, I won't provide a way of escape when this type of temptation comes. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will provide a way of escape so that you can bear up under it. God's not trying to save you from a bad thing. He's trying to save you from death. And most of the time in pastoral ministry, I wish I could wind back the clock to the young man who came down from the rafters and said, Pastor Dan, the FBI broke into my house. I'm going to jail. I wish I could rewind the clock. To the couples who've gone through entire Kleenex boxes because of the pain of confession, I wish I could... I wish I could turn back the clock. If you're listening to me right now and you're finding yourself in this type of temptation and there's an approach that's being made to you, it's a scandalous approach, it's a stunning, shocking approach, it's a subtle approach, the only answer is flee. Flee it. Run from it. Get away from it. Leave everything you have to over it and do it moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day. Because what is on the other side is a man or a woman that so houses the presence and glory of God, the watching world has to take notice. There is a reason why Potiphar did not kill Joseph, and I'm convinced I'm going to discover this one day when I'm in heaven. The penalty for what Joseph did was death. That's not what he got. He got the dungeon. It's because Potiphar knew the problem was probably not with Joseph. It was with his wife. Even the world knew when something's true or it's a lie. So can I just ask, the irony is that man may not see, but God sees. What does he see? What does he see? There's so much to be said on this subject, but I will say this to you. In the Bible, God always provides the grace to carry through the command. So if he says that lust in your heart is the same as adultery, then he doesn't want the second look to be a sexual one. How? You've got to hide God's word in your heart that you don't sin against him. That's the only way. Young men, young women, you're going to have to say no to some of the movies. You're going to have to flee from some of the computers. 
if you have to be the crazy kid that takes notes by hand in college, then do it. I remember being on an away football trip, and we were four to a room, evidently because the college was poor. I walked outside of that college hotel room on an away football trip until 3 o'clock in the morning, and then I had to sleep in the lobby until 7 because of what was happening inside of the rooms. Whatever you have to do, do it to the glory of Christ. And friend, if you've already blown through this, you still can receive forgiveness and God can redeem you if you will choose to obey Him rather than to feed this in the secret places that if people don't see, He does. You will never come into the giftings and the callings and the pleasures of God until you say yes wholeheartedly to God and no to what God expressly says He hates.